Hey everybody, welcome to my very basic guide. This time, it's about being a Pokemon trainer in Dungeons & Dragons. The Beastmaster subclass was considered one of the jankiest subclasses early on in D&D 5th edition, but with the additional supplements from Volo's guide, the errata changes, and of course, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, it might just be enough to allow you to be the very best like no one ever was. Rangers in general are basically fighters, but with a side dish of tree hugging nature powers, which makes them half casters. They naturally gain spellcasting abilities, but with only half of the spell slots that a normal full caster usually gets. Rangers also natively lack cantrips and the ritual casting ability, meaning all of their spells cost something, usually. Because they are essentially hippie warriors that like nature and stuff, their spellcasting ability is wisdom, similar to the druid. It's better to have a best friend that you can always rely on in a world that you may have to defend, so the Beastmaster subclass has always been a really cool concept, at least for me. The Beastmaster subclass in particular has benefited tremendously over the lifespan of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, with the addition of Volo's Guide adding more powerful companion choices and of course the errata that has changed the wording of features from the player's handbook. The errata is like Dungeons & Dragons fix it and post online document that cleans up unclear wording or makes certain changes to features and abilities. The Beastmaster in particular did get quite a bit of facelift from the 2018 November errata posted on TND Beyond. Another big update to the Ranger class and the Beastmaster subclass in particular comes in the form of the optional class feature that comes from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and this video will specifically go over Tasha's version of the Ranger's class features and the shiny new Primal Companion that replaces the old classic Ranger's Companion from the player's handbook. Starting small at level 1, you will travel across the land searching far and wide with either Natural Explorer or Deft Explorer from Tasha's Cauldron. The old Natural Explorer class feature essentially allows you to skip over some of the logistical challenges that you and your party may encounter when traveling across a specific terrain for over an hour. The specific terrain type you choose becomes known as your favorite terrain and you get a lot of various utility buffs that basically makes your life easier when you're in it. The Deft Explorer option on the other hand gives you a lot of sub abilities that you unlock as you level up. At the first level you instantly get Canny which gives you double your proficiency bonus for one of your skills and you instantly learn two additional languages as well. At level 6, you get Roving, which makes you walk faster by 5 feet and also makes your swimming and climbing speed equal to your walking speed. The final Deft Explorer sub-ability is Tireless at level 10. You get to beef yourself up with temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your Wisdom modifier as an action, but you can only use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, but then you regain all of it on a long rest. You also get to decrease your exhaustion level by 1 when you short rest, which is pretty cool since exhaustion level usually can only be brought down through long rests. So that about summarizes Deft Explorer, and there's a lot to take in, especially since it's radically different than Natural Explorer. But I do think that Tasha's version is a lot better, since it's no longer situationally tied to a specific piece of land that the Ranger just really likes. It makes the feature more versatile, and also I think Deft Explorer's effects are just easier to remember and is more intuitive than Natural Explorer. When it rains, it pours, or so they say, since you get another lengthy feature at level 1 in the form of Favorite Enemy or Favorite Foe from Tasha's Cauldron. Favorite Foe allows you to mark a creature that you successfully hit with an attack roll, turning them into your favorite enemy for the duration of one minute, which mechanically works similar to a regular concentration spell, where if you lose concentration, then you also lose your favorite foe mark. This also means that you are probably unable to use other concentration spells in conjunction with favorite foe, but whilst you maintain your mark on the enemy, you do get to deal an additional 1d4 damage. You can only mark an enemy a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and then you can replenish your marks on a long rest. The additional damage that Favorite Foe gives you increases to 1d6 at level 6 and 1d8 at level 14. This basically makes Favorite Foe a Hunter's Mark that actually scales as you level, and it doesn't cost you a spell slot, which is a very strong ability to have especially when compared to the class feature that it replaces in Favorite Enemy. Favorite Enemy from the player's handbook allows the ranger to hate on a specific race in Dungeons & Dragons and the ranger to get various buffs in their ability to track and hunt down their favorite enemy, and they also get to speak their language as well, for some reason. Most of the Tasha's Cauldron's optional class features has a theme of decoupling the ranger to specific types of environments and enemies, making the optional class features much more applicable to a wider selection of encounters, which mechanically feels much better in my opinion. And finally, we get past level 1 and arrive at level 2. You get these passive buffs called fighting styles that help you solidify the type of ranger you want to be. There are 4 fighting styles from the player's handbook for a ranger to choose from. Going over them very quickly, you first got Archery, which gives you a flat plus 2 bonus to your attack rolls with any ranged weapon. And then there is Defense, which gives you a plus 1 to your armor class when wearing armor. Dueling, which gives you plus 2 to your damage rolls when using a melee weapon in only one hand. And then finally we come to 2 weapon fighting. This is the fighting style you pick if you plan on dual wielding as a ranger, 
It allows you to add your ability modifier to the damage roll of the second attack you make with your bonus action. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything also added three additional fighting style options. Blind Fighting is the first one. It allows the ranger to gain blind sight with a range of 10 feet. Blind sight means the eyeballs in your brains can see anything within range that isn't behind total cover, and the perception does not rely on your regular eyeballs working, meaning you can see things even if they're in pitch black darkness, or if you have the blind condition. Blind sight also allows you to see an enemy even if they are invisible to you, but of course the enemy can still do a hide action and sneak away from you. There is also Druidic Warrior, which gives you two Druid cantrips. They count as regular ranger spells and they use wisdom as their spellcasting ability. The Druidic Warrior fighting style also allows you to swap them out with other Druid cantrips when you level up as a ranger. This is a pretty neat fighting style to have since rangers usually don't get cantrips and being able to access the Druid cantrip list without getting a feat or multi-classing can be a lot of fun. Thrown Weapon Fighting is the last of the Tasha's fighting style options, and as the name implies, it allows you to more smoothly attack with thrown weapons and gives you plus 2 to your damage when doing a ranged attack with a weapon with a thrown property. And that about concludes the fighting styles of level 2. We go on to level 3 with the newly revamped Primal Companion from Tasha's Cauldron, which replaces the old Beastmaster level 3 Ranger's Companion. Primal Companion goes for a very different approach to the concept of what a Beastmaster Ranger fundamentally is. With the classic ranger's companion from the player's handbook, you are taking an actual fleshy beast from the physical world and making them into a friend that could help you. With the primal companion, however, you are more of a summoner type ranger that creates a powerful familiar that has one of three stat blocks, but you are able to mold your companion visually into whatever form you want. Your primal companion will always take the dodge action if the beastmaster does not give any commands, which is an ability that comes from the 2018 November errata and is now officially in print with the primal companion. Also, the Beastmaster can use his bonus action to order the Primal Companion to do other non-attack actions besides dodging, such as the dash, disengage, or the help action. This is a big deal to have at level 3, since the classic Beastmaster only got access to this ability at level 7. The Beastmaster still has to give up one of its attacks in order for your Primal Companion to use its attack action, which is fair considering that the new Primal Companions gets to use the Beastmaster's spell attack modifier for its attack rolls, meaning it gets to use both your proficiency bonus and your wisdom modifier, making it much more accurate and scales much better later on in the game than the old Ranger's Companion, which only got to use the Beastmaster's proficiency bonus to add to its attack rolls. We get three stat blocks that define the mechanics of all three Primal Companion variants. First off, we get Beast of the Land, which is the classic brute of the bunch, having slightly better damage output than the rest in its attack action with its maul ability. But what makes the Land Beast interesting is its charge feature that allows you to knock an enemy prone if you move the Beast of the Land 20 feet in a straight line to then maul the targeted enemy, giving the attack an extra 1d6 damage and also for the target to do a strength saving throw against the Beastmaster spell save DC, or get knocked prone on the floor. This is pretty strong since it increases in power as the ranger levels up, and also the beast of the land can move 40 feet and climb 40 feet, which makes it very speedy and potentially allows the beast to constantly knock over enemies on each of its turn. Next up we have the beast of the sea. Beast of the sea has an almost identical stat lineup when compared to the land version, with the same ability scores, same hit point scalings, and the same hit dice. But as you may imagine, the difference comes into the environment it naturally works well in, as in the name suggests. Beast of the Sea is obviously pretty strong when in water, with it being amphibious allowing it to breathe both air and water, and our fishy friend having a natural swim speed of 60 feet. Like most fish out of water, they can't really walk on land, which is represented by the Beast of the Sea having only 5 feet of normal movement, which makes it a pretty niche creature to have on most campaigns. However, it does have a very powerful attack action in the form of its Binding Strike, that does slightly less damage than the Beast of the Land, but if you do land a strike, then the enemy is automatically grappled with the escape DC being equal to the Ranger's spell save DC, which means it actually scales with the Ranger's Wisdom and Proficiency bonus, which is something that companions like the Giant Crab never had. Because of how powerful the auto grapple is, you may consider the Beast of the Sea on land, in conjunction with support spells like Longstrider, giving it that extra speed boost it desperately needs to do anything. The last of the three primal companions we get is the Beast of the Sky, which has some differences in ability scores, and it notably is a small beast rather than medium sized like the previous two. Another slight difference is that it has a lower hit point scaling and hit dice type, meaning it's slightly more vulnerable as you go later into the game. It also has a slightly weaker attack with its shred compared to the Maul, but on average you probably won't be seeing much of a difference. But the main reason you take this Primal Companion version over others is for the flying capabilities of 60 feet and coupling that with the flyby ability allowing it to safely dive bomb enemies and then fly back upwards without provoking any attack of opportunities. All of your beasts also get dark vision of 60 feet, which is pretty handy. Primal Companions can also be revived with any one of your spell slots if it has died within an hour, and then it comes back with its full hit points. 
Alternatively, you can just summon the same or another Primal Companion after a long rest. In Pokemon terminology, it means you no longer have to play Nuzlocke with your companion, making things less traumatic. But perhaps most importantly of all, all of your Primal Companions have armor classes of 13 plus your Ranger's proficiency bonus, which is a pretty good armor class to have, especially considering that the Primal Companion naturally always dodges if you don't tell it to do anything else. I believe that the Primal Companion feature is a definitive upgrade over the player's handbook's Ranger's Companion, since a lot of the woes that normal creatures have when it came to scaling into the later portions of the campaign have been alleviated. The natural armor class adding in the Ranger's proficiency bonus is good enough to the point where Beastmasters no longer have to worry about barding for their fuzzy companions to make them more survivable. Also, all of the beasts get Primal Bond, which allows you to add the Beastmaster's proficiency bonus to any ability check or saving throw that the Primal Companion makes, not just the ones that the beast is proficient in. And the special Rider On effects that the Primal Beasts get in their attacks actually scale with the Beastmaster's proficiency bonus and wisdom modifier. In summary, I think Primal Companions are a big win for the Beastmaster archetype and I think it's just really cool. Another interesting change in Tasha's optional class features comes from Primal Awareness, which replaces the old level 3 Primeval Awareness. Primeval Awareness from Tasha's Cauldron basically gives you a bunch of spells that makes you more nature-y, and it's always cool to have more spells for utility. They don't count against the Ranger's spell cap, and you can also cast each of them once without using a spell slot, and then you regain the free spell cast after you finish a long rest. In many ways, Primal Awareness is the opposite of Primeval Awareness from the player's handbook, since Primeval Awareness costs you your precious spell slots in order to figure out whether a specific creature type is within 1 mile of you, or within 6 miles of you if you're in your favorite terrain. But Primeval Awareness specifically does not give you the location of said creature, or even the number of creatures there are, which makes it a pretty neat change in Primal Awareness from Tasha's Cauldron, which saves the rangers their already limited spell slots and expands their spell sling capabilities. Coming in to level 5, we are reminded that sometimes simple is best, and the extra attack feature is pretty nice for our Primal Companion since this enables us to attack alongside our buddy. We have to give up one of our attacks so that our Primal Companion gets to do theirs, which I still think is a pretty good trade with extra attack allowing the Beastmaster to still be in the thick of things and not just a target dummy that is there to soak up some shots. At level 7, we get some overlap in our abilities from Exceptional Training if we use Primal Companion instead of the Player's Handbook version. The Primal Companion from Tasha's Cauldron already gets to use non-attack actions from the Beastmaster's bonus action at level 3, so Exceptional Training doesn't really benefit Tasha's Primal Companion version that much. But from the Errata, we do get the benefit of Magical Attacks from our Companion, which is fairly strong, and helps our Pocket Monster scale into the mid to late games. Arriving at level 8, we get Landstride, which teaches us how not to get pricked by normal plants with regular thorns, and the ability to pass through non-magical typical terrain as if it were just normal terrain. Landstride also teaches rangers how to gain advantage when rolling saving throws against magically conjured plants that want to trap us or slow us down, which I guess is useful against unhappy fake creatures or druids that you pissed off, and yeah, that's about it for Landstride. It's a nice feature to have, I guess. At level 10, Tasha's Cauldron gives us another alternative option in Nature's Veil, which replaces the player's handbook Hide in Plain Sight. Nature's Veil is pretty simple, in that it gives the rangers the ability to use their bonus action to turn invisible alongside everything they are wearing and carrying. The invisibility ends at the start of your next turn. This is a very powerful ability to have since it doesn't cost you any spell slots and it is not a concentration ability like Favorite Foe. You can attack while invisible and it doesn't count as casting a spell which means you can use Nature's Veil with your bonus action and then cast a regular spell using your standard action. Nature's Veil is only limited by your proficiency bonus, which you have 4 of at level 10, and then you regain your expended uses on a long rest. I think Nature Veil is much better than Hide in Plain Sight, which basically gives you the ability to smear mud and leaves into your face, which gives you a plus 10 bonus to your stealth checks if you stay still, and it takes one whole minute to prepare the camouflage in the first place. So overall, I think Nature's Veil is a pretty significant improvement. One of the bigger power spikes for Beastmaster Rangers will be at level 11 when they get Bestial Fury. Up until level 11, the Rangers themselves was perhaps a better offensive option when factoring in things like your Hunter's Mark, your Fighting Style, and of course your Ranger Spells. It made it so that your Pet Pal was more efficient as a defensive body blocker, but all of that changes with Bestial Fury where the Pokemon Trainer no longer has to go fisticuffs with the wildlife themselves. Your Pocket Monster gets to attack again, or as per the Errata, if they have multi-attack, they can now use that instead. This is a pretty powerful ability and effectively doubles the power output of your companion, making them more offensively useful. At level 14, all rangers get the Vanish feature. This allows you to take the hide action as a bonus action on your turn, which basically means this is a worse version of what the rogues can do with cunning action at level 2. But you know what, it's still nice to have as a ranger, and also you, can, you can't be tracked by non-magical means, which could be useful. At level 15, we get Share Spells, which very aptly describes what the feature actually does. Any spell that you target yourself with will also affect your furry friend if they are within 30 feet of your person. 
These are spells that don't need to have a range of self, so for example, if you cast Cure Wounds on yourself, you will also heal your companion. The share spells feature was really good back in the day, and it's probably even better now since all of your primal companion stat blocks make use of your spell attack modifier, which incentivizes having Wisdom as your primary ability score to max out, which makes a lot of ranger spells better even if you can't share them. Tasha's Cauldron also adds in quite a few more spell options for rangers to have, so it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities since rangers are of course half casters, making the spells they pick along the way very important. Once we reach level 18, all rangers get Feral Senses. This basically allows you to hit enemies that you can't see without getting disadvantage on your attack rolls, which is handy. You also gain a pseudo blindsight effect where you know where invisible creatures are within 30 feet of you, as long as they're not hiding from you and you don't have the blinded or deafened conditions. And finally, at level 20, we get the Ranger class capstone ability, known as Foe Slayer. If you attack a favorite enemy, you get to add your Wisdom modifier as either a bonus to your attack roll or your damage roll. You also get to see the results of the roll first before choosing to buff either the attack or damage. Foe Slayer is a feature that doesn't cost you any action to activate, but you can only do it once every turn. But assuming your Wisdom ability score is high at level 20, this is a pretty strong and reliable capstone ability to have. And that about does it for my very basic guide on the Beastmaster Ranger from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. The Primal Companion stuff is pretty cool, and I think it shores up a lot of the weaknesses that the classic player's handbook Beastmasters had. I hope the video was helpful, since it was tricky trying to figure out how to balance talking about the features that Tasha's stuff was replacing, while also sort of explaining the differences between the original and the new ones. Above all, I hope you guys will all have fun experimenting with the options that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything brings. And as always, I hope that anyone who watches my stuff enjoys what I create as much as I enjoyed creating in the first place. I hope to see you guys next time. Until then, goodbye for now. Hit it!